in every generation someone comes along and brings together a set of resources that we couldn't have existed without. And that's what Glenn Hinson has done in his life and his teaching and his impact. And all I have to say, Glenn, is the old Latin quip, ad multos annos, to many, many more years, please. Thank you. We are going to do a little psalm singing here, um, and I'm going to start off with one of my favorites. I've discovered this. There is a composer on the West Coast called Ron, R-A-W-N, Harbor, Ron Harbor, African American, and uh, he has set the morning psalm, 63, uh, in a really amazing way, and I'm going to ask you to sing with me on this, even though you don't have the music, which is the original way of singing, call, response, call, response. My soul is thirsting, my soul is thirsting, oh, my soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. Just simply say those words. My soul is thirsting, my soul is thirsting, my soul is thirsting for you, my God. And all you have to do is answer, and the O comes in there. So, the melody line will sound a lot like a, a, a Negro spiritual. My soul is thirsting. Just sing that. My soul is thirsting. My soul is thirsting. My soul is thirsting. Oh, my soul is thirsting. Oh, my soul is supply our congregations with the musical idiom, the musical dynamic equivalent, if I may say so, uh, we now have access to every single musical kind of style, the wonderful kind of style that our women and Jimmy played for us, uh, yes, even the, uh, the sound sample style, but we can do Celtic, we can do American folk, we can do African American, we can do Hispanic, Espanol, we can do chant forms, you shouldn't be afraid of it, even though I know some Methodists who say, I shan't chant. <laughs> and so to the last person that said that to me with this liturgical gesture, I shan't chant, I said, do you know of the Father's love begotten? Hear the words be, oh, I love it. <laughs> and I did 
didn't have to say a word. Oh, I see you don't chant. The thing about each musical idiom is that it comes out of a cultural context. All prayer is culturally embodied. And the richness of any hymnal and the richness of singing the psalms is to allow us to overhear, as Fred Craddock would say, overhear another set of voices singing. So I offer that opening one as one that particularly strikes me as very American, very important, because the music itself carries the history of suffering. So I'll say there. Perhaps it was less familiar in translation. Perhaps it was the circumstances of that particular day or simply the accumulation of many suppressed responses to media images of conflict and war. But Psalm 46 appointed for the morning prayer in my small Benedictine book suddenly unsettled me. Come, see the wonders God does across the earth, everywhere stopping wars, crushing, burning all the weapons of war, the end of your fighting, acknowledge me as God, high over nations, high over the earth. And what struck me was the utter unbelievability of those words in the context of that particular Sunday's devotional prayer. And I was supposed to go preach that. The images were familiar. Yet it was as though I had never experienced how radical and impossible was their claim about what God does with respect to human war. Yes, of course, acknowledge God. Yes, of course, end your fighting. But what wonders? What stopping wars? What doing away with all the weapons of war? Some of you may know Benjamin Britten's War Requiem, an extraordinary piece of music. If you don't, don't worry about it. But you do know the story of Abraham and Isaac, don't you? Your Bible people. In this setting of the War Requiem, Benjamin Britten sets that story against the chanted forms of a boy choir singing medieval praises. And Abraham has, is, is told by the angel, don't sacrifice your son. Sacrifice the lamb of pride. But the text sings, but he did not. And he slew his son and half the seed of Europe one by one. A reflection on the first and second wars. That searing realization that we live in a world where that lamentable fact is true against our hope that God will be God for us. I can't put it any more plainly. That's in the Psalms. And I think our world needs that kind of honest speech. So I listened again to Benjamin Britten's War Requiem and found myself not only sort of weeping, but also coming back to the psalm and saying, oh God, tell us it's true. Tell us what you've promised again. And like the psalmist, I found myself saying, be God for us as you have told us to be for us. Now that may not be your cup of tea. That may not be your spirituality. But I'm reporting to you, I am witnessing to you, what many people feel and experience. Praying the Psalms over time, and that's the secret. Not, it's not a one night stand with the Psalms. Nor it is with God, for that matter. Praying the Psalms over time is a spiritual practice. Normally that Psalm 46 which Luther took as his inspiration of a mighty fortress is our God, Psalm 46. For me, it's been an accumulation of an affirmation of the divine sovereignty, God's power in the course of human history, 
All that seemed to disappear under the thought that it was hopelessly naive to think that God makes wars to cease. And in this, I think I'm not alone. To how many others, in how many other circumstances, has such a claim scraped across the chalkboard of our reasonably settled spiritual practice? Are shocks like this simply part of what we should expect with Christian spiritual practice and experience? Is such an accumulation sheer vain hope? Is this simply an eruption in the prayer of some old religious question, why doesn't God do something? Or maybe, maybe, maybe. It was a personal grief burst, since I was in grief at the time, linking personal struggles to global suffering. Like it or not, it will come to some of us. And that's why the Psalms are there. Reflecting at some distance on that moment, the shock does seem something to be expected if we take the Bible seriously. Human history and the tangle of social forces simply prevent claims about God's sovereign power from becoming cliches, spiritual cliches, or prayerful presumptions. God's obviously on our side. Abraham Lincoln struggled with this. Read the second inaugural. It's in our history as Americans. Any accounting of the war dead, and let's include the phrase collateral damage, exceeds my mental range and my moral range. If we are to speak honestly about the spirituality of the Psalms or of authentic Christian prayer, we do have to confront, I'm starting with my own, illusions so easily harbored in acts of spiritual practice. Spiritual self-deception and illusions of security abound when the world's suffering is ingested to the point of overload. There's a passage in a much neglected work by Miguel Unamuno called The Tragic Sense of Life. Those who say that they believe in God and yet neither love nor fear God do not in fact believe in God, but only in those who have taught them about God. Those who believe that they believe in God, but without any passion in their heart, without any anguish of mind, without uncertainty, without doubt, without even an element of despair in their consolation, believe only in the God idea, not in God. I know it's late in the afternoon and you had a lot of stuff, but I gotta say it to you. If what we call spirituality is to come to maturity, it will inevitably have to deal with that passionate heart, with that anguish of mind, with that element of despair, even in consolation, because of the mixed texture of our world, its terror and its beauty, and it confronts our praying and our worship, our meditation and all of our liturgies. For increasing numbers of people on the edge of the church and on the outside of the church, the experience of the absence of God, or at least the loss of secure ideas about God, leads to giving up prayer and worship. I'm reminded of a story that Tolstoy tells. Two brothers are on the hunt. The younger brother is very pious. And so they go into the barn at night and lay down. But before he goes to sleep, the younger brother kneels down in the hay and says his prayer. The older brother is watching him from the hayloft, and he says to him, so you still do that. And then Tolstoy writes, and then the younger brother gave up his prayer, did not say his night prayers from then on, not because he was convinced of something in his own mind, but because the question of his older brother was like a push of a finger on a wall ready to fall by its own weight. So the mixed texture of the world puts pressure on the cliches of Christian faith and practice. For 
for many people, and many people perhaps you know, indifference is the consequence. Some people get hostile. But for many it's, oh, so you still do that. Give it up. For many others, a cry of the heart comes out, pleading for something to replace that which is no longer available. This breeds a form of spiritual practice in which the perceived world seems all chance and fate. Where were you, God, when terror struck? Where are you now? Oh, give up the question. Persons in Christian and in Jewish traditions, let's not forget the middle of the 20th century, recognize these questions that is the language of lament figured in these Hebrew songs. And my point is, don't give up the question. This is the question we must ask of God. Where are you now? Please show up, arise. The incessant images and narratives of unlimited suffering we take from the world of news every night. I mean, this wonderful song that you guys sang about, I don't want to listen to that anymore. Put me in mind of that. Are corrosive of the human spirit. A media generated resignation to the way things are is one response. Avoidance and denial of another. Conventional ideas of God out the window. But I ask, isn't our deeper desire for some form of real encounter and not false consolation? In human relationships, we sometimes settle for the false consolation when what we want is real relationship. Moreover, the daily and nightly menu of news we take in, we ingest like strontium 90 in the bottle, is subject to enormous cultural captivity and religious denial. And such denial builds up within us in our time. Therefore, we are fairly warned, spirituality can become the practices of avoidance. Uh, Johannes Baptist Metz, he says, Sometimes prayer and liturgy can be what he calls a eulogistic, eulogistic evasion of what really matters. <laughs> Evading what really matters in the name of praising God. At the same time, invocation of God can turn empty when we feel the contradictions. My point is, most of us, if we're honest, swing between spirituality as false consolation and spirituality as tragic consciousness. How can we address this? You, you would say, oh, not me. On the one hand, it remains true that religious experience of the world is love almighty and ills unlimited. I love that. <laughs> love almighty and ills unlimited. On the other hand, we're constantly connected through the world, through media, that juxtapose images of war and suffering with the world of advertising, offering chemical and material relief. Suffering and consumerist banality are yoked together. Now, aren't you bemused sometimes? Don't you have to laugh out loud after the chemical, the drug advertisement, whatever it is? There's this long set of disclaimers. Your belly button might fall off. <laughs> your elbow will go green. You'll, you'll actually lose your left ear, or you could die. I, you've got to laugh at this, and that's part of the that's part of the restoration. That's part of the restoration of sanity in the middle of it all. So we must live by confessing our invasions, our contradictions. Popular forms of spirituality, from the prosperity gospel to self-help meditation, really only intensify the problem. What happens to the spiritual life when it becomes only warmed over power of positive thinking? In a world of permanent warfare, carnage, and fear, spirituality can be simply the escape, or at least palliative care. 
some Christians, critical of self-deception, find that squarely facing suffering and carnage in honest prayer actually results in melancholy, a practice view that is very realistic, verging on resignation <coughs> and practical atheism. Or suffering is progressively spiritualized. Oh, it's just an illusion. Buddhism doesn't matter. Does it matter? Not long ago, I was with a group of seminary students, and I was asking them, and they were concerned about becoming pastors and preachers and priests. And almost to a person, I asked them when they replied to my question, "Well, what is it that most concerns you as you enter ministry?" And almost to a person they said, how can we speak to the overwhelming moral pain that people are taking in? At the same time, I was engaged in studying attitudes and practices in several local places, local congregations that were struggling to address the reality of human disability. How do we work with people mentally disabled, physically disabled? And so the inherited cliches about persons with disabilities, physical, mental, or emotional, prevented a real engagement with the actual humanity of the disabled in many of those cases. Not much later, a group of graduate students in theology were trying to discussing issues facing the quality of their teaching. And they kept asking, how do we make theological sense out of the bewildering way in which the everyday world seen through the media is one of massive, unmitigated suffering covered over by the illusions of the quick fix, xenophobia, and various ultra-bright forms of Christianity. Now, these examples, I do not mean to make the afternoon so heavy as this, kind of like we're just eating German potatoes <laughs> or, or Polish dumplings and nothing else. I simply want to say that the Psalms still lie in wait for what we are to do with the enormous gap between the world as it is imaged to us and the world as it ought to be, as God dreams it, as God promises it. So that's the question I have. The gap between the world as it is, with all of its suffering and carnage, and the world as God intends it to be. I want to see. This is inscribed at the very heart of Christian and Jewish practice in spiritual traditions. The gap is not a function of media culture. The experiential struggle with pain and suffering is etched deeply into the psalms of lament, complaint, and protest, and is fiercely obvious in Jesus Christ. Fiercely obvious. It is no accident that he does cry out, Psalm 22, from the cross. Taking it on. Human suffering and experience of the absence of God for good or ill come with the way of life called discipleship, and some of you preached on that text, I suspect. So, from Dietrich Bonhoeffer to Simone Weil to Oscar Romero to Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, medieval women mystics, I'm, I'm just citing the, the syllabus of, of, of Glenn. I'm, I'm citing Glenn. <laughs> Glenn Silvers, women, mystic, the St. Ignatius and the martyrs, to the letters of Paul. This is a crimson thread that runs through them all. Douglas Steer, Tom Merton. Give me the old time religion. It was good enough for them. Should be good enough for us. So those seminarians and the church folk were struggling with the lived experience of the Christian faith in a world permeated by personal, communal, and global suffering created in real places, but magnified and distorted by this odd juxtaposition of the pain we see and hear and all of the chemical and psychological solutions that culture offers. The longer my conversations with them continued, the more specific came the problem. Came the problem. Can the Christian life be lived without the cliches of religious self-deception in this media-dominated culture? This, of course, may mask a questioner's skepticism or even practical atheism. And yet, to anyone who still has a passion for God, who is drawn to the strange and paradoxical promises of the Christian faith, these questions are the ones we should face. Now, current on 
bunch of nerds, religious ones, of contemporary spirituality promote a cheery spirituality of personal victory. Happy well-being, happy well-being rules out any realistic sense of the tragic. And I have confessed that when so many persons have enormous stress and difficulty in their own personal lives, overloading of, of more suffering seems not a very good thing. Empathize. Let's feel good for heaven's sake. It seems so healthy and affirming in a time of numbing complexity. How to control worlds. Political rhetoric that over yeah, I'm getting into it. Political rhetoric that oversimplifies all the significant issues, makes everything that is personal public, and can't deal with the public. <laughs> You know, thank you. That was a good amen. I love it. In the form of laughter, is true. <laughs> Who can blame us for generating whole industries of relief, of entertainment as a distraction, as spiritual practice, as avoidance of the tragic dimension of life? Now, most of us and most Christians in this society don't like ambiguity. We seem not attuned to these things. I do not mean that death, grieving, and sorrow are not person, not part of our personal life. Rather, our religious sensibilities have been formed by self-fulfillment, success, and victory. It could be argued that as a nation, our society cultivates the industries of religion precisely in order to cope with the painful dimensions of our own complicities. For example, with the ambiguous defeat in Vietnam, or the history of our own violence against minorities. It remains very difficult for us to come to terms religiously with, the, with these issues. And yet more and more of us express our fear of losing in Afghanistan or are sobered by the growing casualties and few voices in the body politic and the media cultivate religious views and practices that allow mature interpretations of our present social political crisis. Most prefer, prefer to fall back on cliches, ideological cliches, oversimplified versions of we and they, the righteous and the unrighteous, unreflective invoking divine approval for our country. Oh, if we only had more faith and return to our former values, the ambiguities would go away, wouldn't they? And God would restore peace and prosperity. Mantra, mantra, mantra. Now, I write as a theologian and as a practitioner. With you, I want to pray more honestly. I want to be in a community of faith that knows how to deal with these tensions. And so, I want to ask, how does Christian communal worship of God address these issues? What are the tensions between the surrounding cultures and the church's worship? that so we can be easily ignore self-deception. This is a triple question. It's about God, it's about the meaning of worship, and about spirituality in the public domain. Now, from one perspective, these worries about spirituality, avoiding the problems of human suffering, are no mystery at all. It's no mystery that we want to avoid tragedy. And then Mother Nature gets out of control, and we see something else. We see that the tragedy, the suffering, suddenly draws something out of people they didn't know they had. So we see this odd sense in which the mystery of our being human is forced to the, pump, to the front, simply because there have been people who have suffered death and dimension and destruction. So I ask, are there resources in the Psalms? Are there resources in our worship traditions that could make a difference? The answer is, of course, yes. We cannot simply take in all the suffering of the world as though we can think our way out of it. I have good thoughts. It will go away. Nor can a theological interpretation relieve the pain. The integrity of Christian prayer, the integrity of Christian spirituality, grounded in the fleshly self-revelation of God, resists 
all these proposals. The idea that we can think our way out of the dilemmas is that we need. We are children of the media, of course, formed in technological promises of human power. Now, in counter-reaction, it's tempting to simply say, it's all so tragic. Faith becomes a kind of ongoing obsession with that which can't be changed. Interesting. The wisdom to know the difference? Where did we hear that? We heard it in the 12-step spirituality. We heard it in AA. Those things which we can change a way of living into, not around, what is given. In turn, wars will go on, suffering will not cease, and we settle for a diminished world if we say, oh, it's all so tragic, and God can't do a thing. So what I want to suggest to you now is that the Psalms help us make spiritual practices touch down deeply in embodied areas dispositions that have become part of our ways of being and acting in the world. Prayer and worship and acts of mercy may still cover over deep hurts and disquietudes, but they are our way forward, too. In my family, perhaps in your family, we've always had the saying, the way forward is straightforward. The way through is straightforward. All of us wanted to run around the barn. That comes from my farm back. So I'm revealing myself to you. Is <coughs> Glenn, I loved it that you were born on the farm. You know, don't run around the barn. Look, love's a fire, but it's got to take out the garbage and throw the hay. All right, here's what I want to suggest. I want to move beyond, on the one hand, spirituality as denial. God's in God's heaven and all is right with the earth. And spirituality as fatalism. Oh well, it is what it is. There's a tautology for me. It is what it is. I found myself saying that many times as a way of dismissing the results of real prayer. Ah, it is what it is. I'll say my prayers, or Shakespeare said it better. My prayers rise above, my thoughts remain below. <laughs> so I want to suggest that both those things, and this hurts because it cuts to me, both the spirituality of denial and the spirituality of melancholy fatalism are forms of egocentrism. They are in one sense, you know, we fill the world with our worry and consciousness. Both claim too much for human self-knowledge. One of the things about the Psalms is it keeps coming back to this God we can't control, this subject who addresses us. So the issues here may be too large for us in an afternoon, and no words are ever capable of grasping the full import of the moral pain we have to take in and live with. And yet, true spiritual practice, true prayer based in the Psalms goes on precisely in and through these ambiguities. There must be moments of healing release and moments of encounter with the reality of evil. There will be specific times when, because of honest prayer, of honest worship in daily relationships, we will regain and gain an appropriate distance from all this endless assault. And then there will be times of utter desolation, too. Thus, praise and lament. You see why I'm going all around to simply come back to where we started. Praise and lament fit together because God sees the truth about us and waits for us to speak. To pray is to love, and to love is to be vulnerable. Vulnerable to the unmitigated hurt. Lament comes because something worthy of praise and love is violated. Beyond our persistence in prayer, in practices such as worship, meditation, and acts.
acts of mercy. There remain still embodied witness. The difference between drowning in the tragedy of the world and turning towards the slow work of God is discerning the witness of those whose lives, not just their words, embody lament, intercession, and praise. So oddly, to discover the true praise of God begins with lament. And that's what the Psalms have to teach us again. Speaking the truth in love about human suffering is to prize human life and to intend all life to be open to the divine compassion. Biblical Psalms are a witness to the interanimation of lament and praise. The lament Psalms show protest and accusation even against God in the name of the genuine sin of fear and anxiety of this world. Crying out to God typically remembers the divine promises and typically, as in Psalm 42, 43, and in Psalm 80, says, oh, this is where we are, but we remember, oh God, I remember the cataracts. I remember when we went with the congregation to praise you. It's as though there is this continual oscillation in lamenting to God, we only discover that God is not only lamenting with us, but remembers us in our lowest state. So crying out to God typically remembers the divine promises and asks God to be God. Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Put your trust in God, for I will yet give thanks. It is no accident, then, that warfare and conflict are sinful metaphors, too. Warfare and struggle against the powers of evil, both within ourselves and in the tangled web of history. The letters of Paul admonish us to put on the whole armor of Christ. The Christian does battle against the principalities and powers. And so the history of Christian spirituality dares carry the image of struggle and war into the very realms of the spirit. There's a wonderful set of Reformation references I'd like to make here, and I'll just make it very brief, because you've heard plenty from me on this. But in the 16th and 17th centuries, among the Anabaptists, you ever hear of the Anabaptists? Yeah. Someone said, oh, is that her first name, Anna Baptist? <laughs> they speak very honestly in some documents about following the bitter Christ. Not the happy Christ, the bitter Christ, or the sweet Christ of the establishment. Despite the differences of history and psychological difficulties you and I might have with this, the image of the suffering Christ contrasts with spirituality of happiness and victory. Taking the passion of Christ and the continuing suffering of the world as authentic spirituality implies that the suffering of Christ is encountered always anew. Our lament is for a world in which the divine love and justice is to be made real in the lives of others. Lament and intercession are necessary to a mature spirituality, as much as the rhythms of breathing and heartbeat are. And yet, making a dichotomy of the sweet Christ and the bitter Christ is already a consequence of religious violence. The Martyr's Mirror is the book I have in mind of the Anabaptist tradition. It's born of religious persecution and of making martyrs, both by the Roman Catholic Church at the time and the Protestant Reformation and Reformers too. That's why there's something in the Baptist DNA. It's there as a witness. My point is that prayer and spiritual life cannot become fully mature until the fullness of Christ's enabling sweetness and grace and Christ's bitter suffering as seen as one. That means we have to stretch our conception. The illusions of piety, the self-deceptions self that subvert Christian spirituality remain. It is only by facing the world as it is and crying out on behalf of its warfare and suffering that truthfulness before God is possible. Christian life and the practices of spirituality must be constantly reoriented to what God has promised. No 
cheap grace. But neither a spirituality of cheap grace nor a spirituality of fatalist realism will reveal what God has chosen to do, to love us in our humanity. And neither will reveal how God is at work even through, yes, the ambiguities and the suffering. Lament is necessary because it's already there. Lament is necessary because Jesus took it on. All of it. This is in Jesus' cry of their election. If we only hear it in Good Friday, we play church. It is the prophetic readings, Amos <laughs> included, calling for justice in the midst of corruption and wickedness. <laughs> I have to think that one over a lot. <laughs> there when we break the bread. This broken sign of the one who took it on. And pour out the wine and cry for mercy in the name of the Lamb who was slain. So Christians can appropriate the Psalms because Jesus prayed them all. And as Thomas Merton told us long since, look for the dark voice of Christ the dark lightning of Christ's voice in the Psalms, for he prays those Psalms before we get there. There's the turn I want to take. Without the Christ, who took our life on in all the suffering and death and ambiguity, we may be left with this strange, polar life. Instead, we look to the one who embodies them both. It won't end our spiritual anguish because God has promised to end wars, to wipe away all tears, to end death's dominion. And somehow we have to say God sees that truth but waits. So let us then do away, insofar as we can, with easy doxology and self-serving praise. They are judged and found wanting. But so let us also do away with someone who says, it is what it is. Give up trying. It's tragic. There are four things about intercession that I would like to suggest that fit together with the Psalms, because so many of the Psalms are implicitly interceding for the whole world. We call on God to end wars. We call on God to come to us. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, he said. In fact, isn't that the last prayer of the whole scripture? Because you have come, come quickly. Because you have come to take on the tragedy and the suffering, as well as the joyous, come quickly. So four things about intercession. First, when you intercede for others, you are in solidarity with them, and you can't go home again. Secondly, you hold them before the God who knows them better than you do. Thirdly, intercession is not just the words, but putting yourself in the position of being with neighbor. And fourthly, it is a reminder that God has indeed promised in the words of in the words of Dame Julian of Norwich, has promised that all manner of things shall be well, all manner of things, and all shall be well. No use denying, and the Psalms don't. No use wallowing in the anguish and the guilt. Rather, authentic prayer, schooled in the Psalms, names the matters, and cries out to God and the humans, and intercedes for the world. Oh, come to our assistance, make haste to help us. This is not just for ourselves, but for the sake of the world and the humanity God has promised to save. Christian spirituality calls to mind that Moses pleaded with God on behalf of the exiled Israelites. Abraham pleaded for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Judith and Esther interceded vehemently for God's people. And Christ, the high priest, forever makes intercession for all. And the Holy Spirit intercedes 
in and through our sighs too deep for words. That's good news. So these four points of our intercession are summed up in what Jesus has done. Jesus remembers us. Jesus is in solidarity with us. Jesus' is prayer, animating ours, makes us remember who God is. And however surprising the outcome, it is the God who is fully identified with us. Intercession, praying for the world and for one another, born of women, forces us to face the world of moral ambiguity, Human knowledge, even the most articulate knowledge of the causes of war and suffering is finite and limited, and there can be no presumptive prayer that is made in the name of Jesus. No presumptive prayer made in the name of the incarnate love of God. Thus, our presumptions must be broken open on the rock of not knowing and on the grace of God. But what we find is that there are always witnesses to how lament and praise keep sustaining people against the forces of oppression. Why fiesta in the barrio? Why this hospitality by the Palestinians in the face of oppression? Why <clears throat> this notion of giving of what we have when we have so little? It's the secret hid from the eyes of the world. Most important is the countless witness of women and men who hold fast to the promises of God. And there we see our, we are meant always to live in truthfulness, courage, and hope. And their faith, hope, and love reappear on the far side of suffering, even when we are shaken by the seeming impossible claims of our God. But with God, we say, Nothing is impossible. That's because God has come as one amongst us, who takes our prayers and transforms them, who shows us that the way of truth and honesty and brokenness is the very way back to God. Well, I've said too much. It's too heavy. It reminds me a little bit of the Amadeus, the film Amadeus, you know. <laughs> When Saudi Arabia says, well, there are too many notes, and Mozart says, but they're all perfect. <laughs> <laughs> These are terribly imperfect words. But the word of God, the word of God is perfect. And the law of God is sweet. But the incarnation of God is saving. So think of the Psalms then as your prayer book for learning Jesus again, and listen for his voice in the praise and in the lament. And so I want to illustrate this at the end, if we have a little time, with two psalms then, one from, there are three psalms actually, one from the Iona community of John Bell, and I'm going to ask you to do it, call response. It's the lament psalm 13. Second is a version of Psalm 22, which turns out not just to be lament, but I hope illustrate the very thing I'm talking about. And the final one is, let it all hang out with Psalm 150. So those are the three we're going to do. Here is Psalm 13. Your response is, how long, O Lord, will you quite forget me? You keep singing, how long, O Lord. All right? Face for 
makes Psalm 113, makes it into a cry to God, and obviously implies that God is looking now. <clears throat> Psalm 22, the cry from the cross, but I want you to hear what Psalm 22 actually has in it. You're all familiar with my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And I'll have you sing that. But I'm going to sing a couple of the other stanzas that create this tension between the cry and the answer. are bound together. And I think of this psalm particularly as signaling that it is one in Christ who prayed this psalm on our behalf. We rarely hear the rest of the psalm in connection with the cry. But then, for heaven's sakes, wasn't my whole point not to be tragic? <laughs> as though the whole thing were some kind of real bummer, metaphysical bummer, so there's got to be some release from this, and the release comes when you realize that God knows us better than we know ourselves. I love the colic for purity. You may not pray that prayer, but I love it. Oh God, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, from whom no secrets are hidden, and all desires know, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. And so Mary comes to mind. We heard from Mary earlier. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, the very one whose heart was pierced, it says. So in the end, in the end, it is doxology. And once in a while, we should have a teasing taste of that right in the midst of all the stuff we must, in fact, carry, or better yet, is carried for us by Christ. So here you go. This is praise. This is Psalm 150. 
This is praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody praise the Lord. It's Jeff Cleaver. He's a blessed memory. It's a wonderful song. I'll sing the verses, but you got to sing this. Praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody praise the Lord. Come on, with me. Thank you. 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 Thank you.